Arlene. And this is Dan. And we are so excited to be here and to worship our King, for he is worthy. Amen. So wherever you are, please join us as we worship our Lord. Amen. Good. 
There we go. It's probably me. Amen. Try that again. I, I was on mute. Praise God. Uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us. And again, thank Arlene and Dan for that beautiful worship service. I'm going to ask everybody, uh, if you're together in the house, join hands for a second. We want to open up with a word of prayer. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you and we declare that this is the day the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, that no matter what goes on around us, Lord God, no matter uh, what changes around us, Lord God, the thing that never changes is your faithfulness. Lord God, you are faithful and true, and we rest in you. So, Lord God, we find our hope in you, and Lord God, we ask that you would bless this time. Lord God, bless each family that has taken out uh, the time to watch us and tune in, and Lord God, may your hand of grace be upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Um, as you probably heard by now, uh, we have uh, uh, some announcements to make at the end of this service about next week's service. Uh, we're excited about meeting. Uh, we're going to have our, our first outdoor service in the back. But again, we'll talk about that when, this, when the, the, the message is over. So I'm going to ask you to, you know, hang in for a few minutes while I give some directions, some announcements for that, okay? Um, open your Bibles, if you will, to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 6. 2 Samuel, chapter 6. The title of the message today is The Chariot and the Ox Cart, or Chariots and Ox Carts. And the question I have for you is, which are you driving? When you pull into church... Are you pulling it in a chariot or are you pulling in an ox cart? When you pull into your job, are you pulling it in a chariot or are you pulling in an ox cart? So chariots and ox carts, what are you driving? Well, to kind of set up where we're at in 2 Samuel chapter 6, the ark of God, the presence of God, has been out of Jerusalem for about 20 years up to this point. I mean, just think about the implications of that that God allowed his presence to be taken out from the midst of his people for 20 years as a type of judgment against the people of God. And so finally David now has become king and David wants to bring the presence of God back into the, into the midst of his people. And that should be a prayer that uh, we all pray, that should be a desire that we all have, to bring the presence of God back into the midst of the church, back into the midst of, of uh, God's people. So I'm gonna pick it up there, that's where we are. So after 20 years, the ark is finally being brought back into Jerusalem. So let's see that in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Let's read. And it says, And David arose, I'm in verse 2, and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, uh, that dwells between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart, an ox cart, and they brought out the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, not Ohio, sorry Dave and Dave, the sons of Abinadab drove that new cart. Um, and David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments, made of fir wood, even on harps, on psalteries, on, on timbrels, on cornets, on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God to hold of it, because the oxen had shaken it, or they hit a bump in a road, and the oxen were, were shaking that cart back and forth, and the ark of God was about to tip over. It says, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died uh, by the ark of God. So we have a, uh, a, a terrible story, a famous story in the Bible, and a terrible story in the Bible. And the thing is, this never should have happened. It did not have to happen this way. And uh, I, I think, I believe in my spirit that this story symbolizes so much of the church today. That yeah, we have good intentions. Yeah, we want to bring the presence of God back in amongst the people of God, back in amongst the church, but we're using ox carts to do it. Now, 
this is also a situation where uh, Uzzah, you know, was trying to do a good thing, right? I mean, come on, the ark of God was about to tip over, and all he did was stretch forth his hand to try to stop it, to try to hold it from falling perhaps even off the ox cart, and he was smitten because of it. Well, the reason why he was smitten was because he was violating God's ordinance. He was violating God's word. The ark of God was never to be touched by the hands of men. Never. But yet he did it anyway. So he had good intentions. And this is a principle that is completely um, lost in, in society today. Good intentions aren't good enough. We have to do the right thing. And we have to be obedient to God. And they were disobedient to God. And I want you to see that in their mind, they must have been so excited. Yeah, yeah, man, we're doing this for God. We're finally bringing the presence of God back over here. David is in front of them, and they got the worship band out there. And whoo, man, we're worshiping God. Isn't that great? We have singers. We have dancers. We're going to go before the ark of God. God, you must love all that we're doing for you right now. We might have banners. We might have, you know, you name it. We have it over here, God. And so, the, so we're doing this for you. But remember a famous portion of Scripture. To obey is better than to sacrifice. God is looking for us to obey His Word and do things the right way. So how do they decide, again, to bring the ark of God back into Jerusalem? They said, well, guess what? We got a great idea. We're going to have a cart and have oxen pull it into Israel, and into Jerusalem. But guess what? You know what? We're going to make a new ox cart, because you know what? God will really be impressed with that, you know? Like if we pull into the parking lot an old car, God's not impressed with that. But if we pull into the, the parking lot with a new car, God's like, whoa, man, I'm so impressed. you got a new car. So they actually thought that God would be impressed that they made a new ox cart. And you know what? I, I, I've realized that in our society that we live in today, we are somewhat obsessed with new things. That we, think, that we think everything new is always better. And we've been sold on that um, by uh, ad agencies forever and ever and ever. Everything is new. Everything is improved. And in our mind, new is always better. But that's not always the case with God. New is not necessarily always better. Now, I was wondering, where do you think they came up with the idea for this new ox carts. Where, why would they think that? Because God's word clearly specified how they're supposed to carry the ark of God. It was clear. It was on, on the shoulders of the priests, on the shoulders of men, the ark of God or the burden of the Lord was supposed to be carried. So where do they come up with this idea that we're going to put it on a new ox cart? Well, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 6. First Samuel chapter 6. Now, in this story, the ark of God, and this is how they lost the ark of God, by the way, the ark of God was taken captive by the Philistines, by the Philistine army, because the people of God, again, were not doing the right thing. So, so finally God said, enough with you, I'm going to go to another people. And he went to the Philistines, and he ended up destroying the Philistines all by himself, um, with his power, with the power of that ark. And so finally, after a period of time, now, it, it, it's funny, the Philistines were rejoicing. Yes, we have the Ark of God. We've defeated uh, the God of, of, of the Israelites. And I don't know, a couple of weeks later, they decided, we need to get the Ark of God. We need to get the presence of God out of here. We can't handle it. And so what did they do? They said, we got to get this Ark out of here. And I'm going to read in, in 1 Samuel chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. And here's how they decided to do it. They said, now therefore we will make a new cart. There it is again. And take two uh, oxen on which there hath come no yoke and tie the oxen to the cart and bring their calves home from them so they're all alone. And then we will take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart and we'll put some jewels on it. We'll put some offerings on it and we'll just let it go and say, get out of here. Go. Go back to Israel. We don't want you over here anymore. So the people of God, you got to catch this. The people of God were modeling the Philistines. They were modeling the world 
on how to move the presence of God. They were using the Philistines, their example, on how they did it, they copied it. In other words, that, that, that describes so much of what's wrong with the church today. We are modeling the world. We're modeling the Philistines on how to try to get God to move in our presence. But here's the irony over here. Number one, it was unsaved, uncircumcised, wicked Philistines who they were copying, number one. And number two, their method was not to bring the presence of God into them or towards them. Their method was to get the presence of God away from them, out of them. And that's how uh, David, and that's how the Israelites, that's the model they decided to use. They were copying the world's way of doing things. And so often, we want to copy the world's way of doing things. Now, you know, I said a, a, a few moments ago that we're obsessed with the new. Everything has got to be new because in our mind, newer is better. And the reason why we think that is because since we were born, every commercial on TV, every magazine article always tells us that newer was better. You know, yesterday I was talking with uh, Mike Mastrakova. Mike, if you're there, God bless you. I love you. Thank you for coming by the house. Our air conditioning went down on the hottest day of the year, most, most humid day of the year. And um, we were talking a little bit, and we were talking about how long some of these units last, how long some of these things last. And here you have these newer units, and like they go sometimes only eight and 10 years. And yet he was telling me about older units that he's had worked on that are there for 15, 20, 25 years. Yet somehow newer is better. I was telling him the story how, you know, a couple years ago, my refrigerator, which was a newer, nice stainless steel refrigerator, and how all of a sudden it started going and it wasn't doing its job. And uh, first the freezer went, and then the uh, refrigerator side started to go. So I called a repair guy who lives very close by, and he came and he checked it out, and he was there for two minutes. He said, oh, you need to go get a new one. I said, go get a new one? How old is this? He goes, oh, it's eight years old. I go, eight years old? I go, my mother still has the same refrigerator from before I was born. How in the world is this refrigerator done after only uh, eight years? He goes, oh, that's all they last nowadays. So newer is not always better. Of course, there's some aspects of it that are better, but newer is not always better. So sometimes we delude ourselves into thinking that, man, I've got to do something new. Because you know what? If we do something new, it, it, it'll, it'll maybe bring the presence of God in. And God spoke something to my heart as I was preparing this message today. Now, in, um, in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19, I want you to check this out. God says, I will do a new thing. Now, what's the difference over here? The difference is we are looking to do new things. When it is God who says, I will do a new thing. But here's what God spoke to my heart. God said to me in my heart when I was preparing this message, he said, I will do a new thing after you do the old thing. After you fulfill the old things that I have commanded you to do. So often we want to move on to new things that we have even fulfilled the old things that God has asked us to do. God gave them um, uh, strict instructions on how the ark of God was supposed to be carried. It was not by oxen. It was to be carried on the shoulders of men. But they ignored it. They forgot it. And they were so excited, well, if we get a new cart, if we do a new thing, well, certainly God's going to be happy about that. He's going to be pleased about that. And then it'll be a, a new move that we'll bring into the city. No, no, no. God will do something new after we've fulfilled the old things that God has asked us to do. Now, let's talk about church today. I mean the overall church today. We're all praying for revival, right? If not, we should be. We all want God to do something great. We all want God to move in a mighty, mighty way. We all want God to do a new thing, right? And how does the average church um, arrive at how God's going to do a new thing? By us doing new things. Oh, we need new this. We need new that. We need new technology. We need new programs. We need new songs. We need new designs. We need a new sanctuary. We need to do all new things so that God could do a new thing. 
That's how the church is. There are conferences about this, and again, I think there are many new things that we could do that could help. But just think about this. We want God to do a new thing in the church of Jesus Christ when we still haven't walked in the old commandments that he's given us. Churches today are filled with hatred and racism and bigotry and uh, abortion and divorce and pornography. And we want to ignore those things, those old sins that God said, get them. The Bible says that these things should not be named once among you, right? That's what the Bible says. These things should not be named once among you. And yet in every church, they're named hundreds of times. Yet we want God to do a new thing. And so instead of us embracing the old thing that God has commanded us to do, we said, no, 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 we'll have new programs. We'll have new things. That's it. No, no. That's how the world does things. We need to fulfill and embrace the old things that God has said and not go to look to a new ox cart that that's going to solve the problem because that new ox cart represents the Philistines. It represents the world's way of doing things. And let's look at that ox cart for a second too. How do you think that ox cart drives down the road? But um, but um, but um. You know, real slow, real plodding, real bumpy. In fact, we know it was bumpy because the ark of God almost fell over as a result of hitting one of those bumps and those oxen shaking it back and forth. And that describes so much of Christianity today that we are okay with just plodding down the road, no sense of urgency, none whatsoever. And so everything is honky-dory. They even use that term anymore nowadays, honky-dory? No, my daughter shaking her head. No, they don't use that term. Well, we use that term, okay? And everything is fine. Everything is wonderful. No sense of urgency. We're just going to plod on down the road in our ox cart pulled by these oxen. And uh, hey, if we get there tomorrow, if we get, who cares? No, uh, there is a sense of urgency. We're living in the last days. People are dying and going to hell every day. And we're content with just plodding down the bumpy road in our ox cart. And that's not going to get the job done. The ark of God was always intended to be carried on the shoulders of men, where we bear the burden of God, where we carry it with us, where we sweat, where we ache, where we work the work of God. You know, new technology is great, but you know what? It's, it, it, it brings each new generation to a lazier, to a softer, to a less appreciative place because, hey man, we don't have to work as hard. And we're producing generations that, that think that you know, hard work is bad, like we're allergic to hard work. We want everything handed to us, we want everything given to us. No, the ark of God was always supposed to be a burden that's carried on the shoulder of men. You know, some of those that have been around here for a long time in our church, which this is our 25th year um, anniversary, and we'll, we'll remember that for more than one reason, our 25th year anniversary. You've heard me say this, but it's true. Some of the greatest services that we've ever had as a church came after we had to do all this physical work to load and unload and set up and break down and we're carrying signs. You heard me say we're carrying signs outside and bringing those signs in. We're setting up sound equipment everywhere. But you know what? we were bearing the burden of the Lord upon our shoulders. We were carrying it with us. And we literally, many of us took it home with us because we were taking stuff home and, and loading it in our cars, unloading our cars and bringing it back with us. But we had glorious services back in those days, glorious worship back in those days. And I believe one of the reasons why is because so many more of us were carrying the presence of God. We were carrying the ark of God on our shoulders. Listen, I wrote this down. Moses did not carry the tablets of stone down from the mountain on the back of a donkey. The walls of Jericho did not fall down because the ark of God was driven around the city seven times on an ox cart. Just think about that. Just think for a second. 
about those priests. Now, Jericho was a big walled city. And every day, the Bible says, the priests of God carried the ark around the entire perimeter of the city. And on the seventh day, they had to carry the burden of that ark, which was made of wood, plated with gold, with angels on top. In other words, this thing weighed, you know, a few pounds, man. And they had to carry it around the perimeter of that city seven times. How in the world did they endure seven times? times around that city i have no idea that is a herculean effort that they had but they faithfully they bore that ark on their shoulders their shoulders must have been aching their shoulders had to be in so much pain their backs had to be in so much pain but what was the result of it the result of it was that the walls of jericho fell down if they put that ark on the back of a cart and had the oxen carry it around and drive around the city seven times, when they blew the trumpet, you know what would have happened? Nothing. But they carried the burden of the Lord with them, the responsibility of God with them. They carried it with them wherever they went. The Jordan River would not have parted, or did not part, I should say, because the priests of God floated the ark on a wooden raft across it. No. When they crossed the Jordan to get to the promised land and the waters parted, it parted because the priests of God carried the ark upon their shoulders and they began to walk into the water with it. And the waters did not part until the priests got into the water. Then the river parted. And then the people crossed over. All these great and mighty things. I mean, how old was Moses? Moses was, was, you know, well over 80 years. How many thousands of feet did he have to climb down that mountain? You know, when you watch a, a, a movie on TV, it's like, you know, we almost had a paved way, paved trail going down. I don't think there were any paved paths going down that mountain. It had to be an unbelievable um, labor for Moses. And also, every time they moved and the um, tabernacle, tabernacle of God had to be set up, you know how to set it up by himself? Moses. He had to physically labor and carry, and I don't know how in the world he did it, there was another Herculean effort that he did. Because, man, those, uh, those tents and those walls, those skins that they covered everything, they had to weigh a ton. But Moses, it was his, uh, his responsibility to bear the ark and to bear the temple and to bear the law of God under his shoulders. That's how God has chosen to move. God has chosen to move on the shoulders of men. Because when we bear the burden of the Lord... It means something. It means our heart is into it. It means our passion is into it. It means we're running that race. It means we're doing all that God wants us to do. Praise God. And again, I don't know how they circled um, Jericho seven times, man. So the Ark of the, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the covenant, uh, the cart, there it is, the ox cart, represent a couple of things. Number one, it represents the world's way of doing it. Because remember, they got that idea from the Philistines. It also represents the fact that they were no longer too concerned about what God's word had to say. <clears throat> now, they had good intentions, they had good desires, but they didn't want to do it God's way. They wanted to do it a new way, thinking that that was gonna, oh, it's certainly going to be easier. Hey, man, you know, we got a couple miles uh, to get from. Uh, here all the way to Jerusalem, you know, that's going to be tough. It's going to be a long, hard walk. You know what? It'll be so much easier to put the ark in the back of a cart, let the oxen do the, all the work over here. Of course, that would have been easier, but God's not looking for easier. God's looking for men to bear the burden of God and not do it on man's worldly inventions and schemes of doing things. God is waiting for us to be obedient and also another thing it represents, as I said earlier, but I have to emphasize this, it represents there is no sense of urgency on getting the presence of God back home or the presence of God to the people or moving the presence of God. No sense of urgency because, man, that ark was just <laughs> casually plodding along as those oxen were taking it 
in no rush whatsoever. The church of Jesus Christ, we need to be in an urgent state right now. We need to understand that the alarms are sounding. The last days are upon us. And the last days are upon us in, in two ways. The last days are upon us in the fact that Jesus is, is going to return, uh, return soon, and also the fact that people that we know, the last days are going to be upon them. We're all going to come across people that are going to die in one format or another, and they need somebody with a sense of urgency to tell them the gospel message, to tell them the good news. But we just can't plod along. So that's what the ox cart represents. Also, by the way, I want to throw this out. In the New Testament, <clears throat> it refers to oxen as brute beasts every once in a while. And the phrase brute beasts represents um, animals who are moved and guided purely by their emotions, purely by the desires of their flesh, as opposed to uh, human beings, especially children of God, how we're not so much guided by our emotions, our flesh, our hungers, our desires, but we're guided by a, a higher guiding call, which is the Spirit of God. So that's what brute beasts or oxen rep are represented in the New Testament. They're representing people who are not governed by the higher calling, by the spiritual calling. They're governed by the flesh. They're governed by their, our own hungers, our own desires. And this was a great mistake that uh, David had made. And look what it led to. How many people, after, now, by the way, after um, uh, Uzzah died, they just left it there. They just left it at Nacon's threshing floor, and they took off. They said, Nacon, this, uh, this is your responsibility. We're out of here. We don't want to deal with God anymore. And they left. They literally left the ark of God on, at Nacon's threshing floor, where he did his work with wheat and barley and so forth. How do you think the people felt after Uzzah died? Think about that for a second. Don't you think they were saying, oh, this is so unfair, or oh, I'm so confused. How could this happen? In fact, they did, they left confused, thinking, man, there's no way to get the presence of God over here, you know? God must be against us. They were confused. Some people, I'm sure, Uzzah's family were, was angry. How could God let this happen? How could God do that? And blaming God and pointing the finger at God, and total confusion took control. Because, well, we had good intentions, we had good plans, and it resulted in confusion, anger. But the reality is, if they did it the right way, if they obeyed God's word, none of that would have happened. And I wonder how often things happen, bad things happen to Christians in church, and people get what? They get confused, they get angry, you know. Uh, God, why did, why did this happen? God, why did that happen? You know, and, and angry at God. Could it be because we as the church overall are doing things according to our intentions, but not doing things according to God's way of doing things? And then when something goes wrong, we blame God? Well, God's answer is going to be, if you just did it the way my word told you to do it. This would have never happened to you. The ox cart, again, also represents a people who are no longer committed to the word, who are no longer committed to the standards that God has set. Instead, we're going to set our own standards. If it looks good to us, if it sounds good to us, if it's acceptable to us, if it makes sense to us, well, that's good enough for us, then we're going to go ahead and do it that way. So let's go ahead and build this new ox cart because it all makes sense to us. No, God said, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. It's about doing it God's way. So that's what the ox cart represents. Now turn with me. Turn with me to, hmm, where should we go next? Second Kings. Chapter 10. Now I want to tell you another story. <clears throat> I mentioned this in a, in a message I preached about the Rechabites about two or three years ago. We're going to tell the story of Jonadab. Now, God was bringing judgment against the wickedness of, of Ahab and his family because they were wicked in the sight of the Lord. And not only did they do wickedly, 
but they caused the people of God to do wicked things. So God had raised up uh, a, a young man by the name of Jehu. Now, ironically, the name Jehu means Jehovah. It's like a shortened form of Jehovah. And he sent them to go, and he sent them to destroy all the wickedness of King Ahab, his family, and his wicked priests that were doing cultish things. He sent him to destroy all those things. And along his journey, this little confrontation takes place that we're going to read right now. So we're in 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 15, it says, And when he departed thence, okay, he lighted or he came upon, so when Jehu departed, he came upon uh, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, and he came out to meet him. And Jehu saluted him, or greeted him, and said unto him, Is your heart right? Is it just like my heart? And Jonadab answered, It is. And notice what he said. This is Jehu speaking. This is Jehovah symbolically speaking. He said, Give me your hand. And he took him up into his chariot. And he said, Come with me and, and see my zeal for the Lord. And he caused him to ride in his chariot. Again, the title of this message Are you riding in a chariot? Are you riding in an ox cart? So, what's taking place over here? Jehu is destroying the enemies of God. And as he's going from one location to another location, and of course now his reputation is starting to get out and, and preceding him, he comes across somebody by the name of Jonadab. And Jonadab, Jonadab walks out to him to meet with him, and Jehu has a mission. Jehu has a plan in his mind. He wants to invite Jonadab to join him on his mission of destroying the enemies of God. He wants to bring him into his chariot with him. He wants to fill him with the zeal for God. But he asks him an important question first, and this is the question that says everything. The whole message is based upon this one question here. So he greets him, and he says this. He says, ask him this. He says, Jonadab, is your heart with my heart? Do you have the same heart, the same vision, the same desire that I have? Because if you do, I'm going to welcome you into my chariot with me, and I want you to ride with me. Because the heart of Jehu was to fulfill the mission of God, to destroy the enemies of God, to do whatever God desired him to do. That was his heart. And he said, Jonadab, is your heart the same as my heart? Do you also want to fulfill the will of God? Do you also want to destroy the enemies of God? Do you also want to uh, be obedient to God? If so, give me your hand and come up into the chariot with me. And Jonadab, without Jonadab, without hesitation, replied, my heart is your heart. My heart is with you. And he got up into the chariot with Jehovah. He didn't go into the ox cart. He got onto the chariot of God. And he rode with him. And he said, now I want you to partake. I want you to taste of. I want you to get infected with my zeal for my God. Praise God. And in a moment, I'm going to tell you how much it affected Jonadab and his family. Now, let's talk about that zeal a little bit, and let's compare the chariot to the plodding of the ox cart. Prior to this, a few verses prior to this, if you read on in the story, Jonadab was going to a, a stronghold of, of one of the wicked and he's, you know, probably miles away, and he's coming towards them. And on the uh, walls, of course, they had watchers looking. <clears throat> and they saw a great puff of smoke and dust out into the distance, and they knew somebody was coming towards him. And these people went to the, 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 the king that was in there, the ruler that was in there, and they said, somebody is coming, somebody's coming. And the king said, well, send out somebody and go find out who it is. And, and the captain said, uh, we already did that and they never made it back. 
Well, send somebody else out then. And he said, uh, we already did that too. And they never came back. They said, well, who is this person that's coming? Now, they're still a far way off. Check this out. And the captain said, it must be Jehu. Now, they didn't have the big binoculars or magnifying glasses back in those days. Magnifying glasses. Binoculars or telescopes. <laughs> oh, there it is from a distance. They didn't have that in those days. So he said, how do you know it's Jehu from, he's still maybe a quarter mile away or half mile away. He says, because he drives furiously. <laughs> that's what it says. He's driving away like someone who is filled with zeal. He is creating such a plume of dust and, 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 and smoke and sand. It could only be one person. His zeal was seen by the enemy from far away. They knew it was Jehu because he was driving furiously. I love that term. I love that phrase in the Bible. In other words, he took the zeal for God with him wherever he went, and it was seen from afar off wherever he went by anybody. It was the zeal of God. Now, I also wrote this thought down over here. The enemies of God, the enemies of the church, and the enemies that are out to destroy your children will not be destroyed by someone riding in an ox cart. You hear what I just said? The enemies of your God, the enemies of the church, the enemies that are out to destroy and take out your children, they will never be destroyed by somebody who's driving in an ox cart. They will only be destroyed by somebody who is driving in a chariot with God that has the zeal of God, the fire of God upon them. I would rather have one person on my side who is driving in a chariot with the zeal of God than 1,000 lukewarm Christians who are plodding along in an ox cart. This world today needs people, needs warriors, needs Christians who are going to rise up and hop into the chariot alongside of God and drive furiously and let their zeal for God consume them and change the world and destroy the enemies of God and overcome the enemies that are out to destroy your children. You know, one of the saddest things for any pastor on the face of the earth is when he preaches the word and he's got beautiful people in his congregation and month by month or year by year he sees children of the congregation get picked off one at a time one at a time and now they're no longer serving god they're out now out in the world they're lost in the world or to see marriages that are destroyed and the reality is they're being picked off by the enemy one at a time. And why does this happen? It happens, I'll guarantee you, because those parents, because that couple, they've chosen to ride in an ox cart and just kind of coast along in their faith. Coast along, lukewarm. Yeah, I go to church. Yeah, I have good intentions. Yeah, I have good ideas. But like I said, the enemies of God and the enemies of your, of, of your children will never ever be destroyed by someone who's riding in an ox cart. It's only that person who decides to mount up with God and be filled with the zeal of God that destroys the enemies of God. And that's who God is looking for in this day. Never before in our lives have people been so open because of uh, the pandemic and the fear that's attached to it. It's time to go into our garages and pull out our chariots. It's time to take our ox carts and burn them and start once again riding with God, with the zeal of God. Now let's go back and I'll finish with um, Jonadab. You don't really see much more of Jonadab after this, but his name comes up later in Scripture and it's one of the most amazing stories that has touched my heart. And if you remember a couple of years ago, I preached on the Rechabites and I said that my family, I declared that my family we're part of the Rechabites. By, by the Spirit, we've adopted ourselves into the Rechabite family. Because during this particular time, the, uh, the city of Jerusalem was about to be besieged. It was, out, it was about to be destroyed by an enemy. In other words, the judgment of God was going to come down upon uh, the Israelites because they had continued to disobey God. They, they continued to be uh, sinful. And God said, if you disobey me, you know, 
this is what's going to happen to you. And guess what was happening to them? And so the armies of the enemy were starting to gather and surround Jerusalem. And all the people who lived outside Jerusalem were now coming in and Jerusalem was packed. Packed. Because they were hiding, look, looking for a protection. And the, uh, and, and, and the priests and the prophets at the time were crying out to God, said, oh God, spare the people, spare the people. Destroy the enemy. And God said something interesting. He told his prophet, he said, and, and, and priest, he said, go and find the Rechabites and bring them in and sit them down in the temple and serve them wine from the temple. Now again, there were I don't know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in Jerusalem, and somehow they found this band of people called the Rechabites, and they brought them in. I don't know how many there were, 20, 30, 40, I have no idea. And they brought them in, <clears throat> and they sat them down in the temple. And I'm sure the Rechabites had to be scared. Why are we being singled out? Why are the priests of God, you know, of the temple uh, uh, coming after us like this? They, they lived on the outside. They lived as a, a nomadic life. And uh, what's going on over here? And God said, I want you to serve them wine. Oh, strange thing. So they served them wine. Now, you've got to understand, in Eastern culture that day and to this day, if you reject something that is offered to you, it's considered a great insult. Great insult. That's just by anybody, never mind by the priests of God and the prophet of God. And they serve them wine, and they're all kind of just sitting there looking at each other. And finally, probably the eldest said, I'm sorry, but we can't drink this wine. And the priest said, well, why not? They said, because our father, Jonadab, he made us swear an oath that we will have no wine and about four or five other things that represent a committed lifestyle unto God. He made us make a vow that we would not do any of these things. So therefore, I'm sorry if you're offended. I'm sorry if you're hurt. I'm sorry if it will even cost us our lives. But we will not disavow the vow we made on behalf of our father, Jonadab. We will not do it. Now here's the amazing part of this. Jonadab lived 300 years earlier. Jonadab was long dead. Generation after generation after generation had come by, had come and gone. Yet the Rechabites, the sons of Jonadab, were still obeying his oath, his vow that he made them take. Why? Because the zeal of God was so powerful on Jonadab's life. Why? Because he rode in the chariot with Jehovah. He rode in the chariot with God. He worked side by side with God, and he was so overcome with zeal that he passed that zeal on for generation after generation after generation after generation. And his great, 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 great grandchildren were still affected by that zeal. But there was one more. There was a great benefit that came as a result of it. Because why did God do such a thing? God said to the prophet, he said, if the children of Jonadab, Jonadab, if they could obey the word of their father that was given 300 years ago, then why can't my people obey the word that's been given by my prophets again and again and again and again and again and that's what sealed their fate they were going to be destroyed by their enemies they were going to be judged for their sins and god used the rechabites as a standard but then god turned around and said to the family of of the rechabites and jonadab and his family he said and a member of your family will stand before my presence every single day throughout history. Somewhere, some way to this day, there is a son or daughter of Jonadab who is standing before the presence of God and has great favor with God. Think about that. 
This is now we're thousands of years later. Thousands of years later. And still the zeal of Jonadab that was coursing through his veins because his heart was right with God. He had the same heart of God. He said, I don't want to drive in an ox cart. I want to drive in the chariot with God. I want to be filled with the zeal of God. Because of that, over 2,000, 3,000 years later, that zeal is still causing members of his family to be blessed and have favor with God. So I miss you in the challenge to uh, my church and to every church that's out there. Let's put away the ox carts. Let's burn them. I can't help but think of when uh, Elijah came by, Elijah came by Elisha and put his mantle on him and called him. That before Elisha left, now he was plowing a field with oxen and whatever cart that he was riding on with the oxen. He had uh, 12 teams of oxen. It was a big, 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 big uh, field. And the Bible says that before he followed Elijah, he slew all the oxen. And he took whatever machinery cart that he had that was with it, and he destroyed it, and he burned it. Praise God. Because he was saying, before I move on to serve my God, I'm getting rid of the oxen. I'm getting rid of the ox cart. I'm getting rid of the plow. I'm burning it because I'm going in 100% with my God. And thank God that he did because Elisha became one of the greatest prophets in all the Bible. Elijah was great, but the Bible records that Elisha did twice as many miracles as Elijah did. And why? Because he said, I'm not riding I'm not riding an ox cart. I'm burning my oxen. I'm burning my cart. I'm sold in with God 100%. And I'm going to close with this. He had a vision of chariots his whole life, the chariots of God, because I said a couple of weeks ago, now Elisha is now the prophet. Elijah had gone to be with heaven, to be in heaven with God. But what caused the anointing to come upon Elisha's life? Elijah said, you'll get a double portion if you see me taken away. And the Bible says that Elisha saw, what? A chariot of fire come down and pick up Elijah and take him away. Elisha had a vision for chariots, chariots of fire, chariots of zeal. And then we have one more story where now Elisha is being surrounded by the enemy to take him captive and Elijah's servant, Gehazi, walks out. You remember the story, I just told it uh, maybe last week or the week before. And he sees the armies of the enemy around them, and he turns, he runs back in, he says, oh, master, master, we're in trouble, we're going to die. We're surrounded by the armies of the enemy. And he says, chill out. Come with me. And he takes him outside. And he prays, he says, oh, Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. And all of a sudden, Gehazi's eyes, eyes open and Elisha asks him, what do you see now? He sees, guess what? I see the chariots of God covering the mountains all around this valley. Elisha saw the chariots. He saw the zeal. He brought it with him wherever he went. And I believe why he was able to have a vision of the chariots, a vision of the zeal for God, because when he started his ministry, he first crucified those oxen, crucified his cart or whatever equipment that he had with him, burned it and said, I want none of that in my life. I pray that we have a vision of the chariots of God, of the chariots of fire. I pray that our heart is the same heart that Jehu's heart or that God's heart was, and we get into that chariot with him. Next Sunday when you come, we'll talk about this in just a second. Next Sunday when you come, I pray that in my spirit, out of my spiritual eyes, that this parking lot is filled with chariots, chariots of fire, because we're filled with the zeal of God. Amen. Let's pray, and then I have a couple of announcements to make about next, uh, next Sunday. Amen. Father, I pray that the church arise, and Lord God, we put off our ox cart. Lord God, we start living our faith with a sense of urgency, 
we start living our faith in compliance and obedience with your word. We no longer set up our own standards to live by, our own new creations, our own new things that we came up with. And that, Lord God, we want to grab hold of your old things so then that you could do a new thing within the earth today. Lord God, I pray that right now at this moment, Jehu is pulling up alongside everybody who's listened to this. And he's saying, is your heart with my heart? If so, come up and join me in my chariot and experience the zeal of God. Lord God, may we ride through this um, North Jersey area. And perhaps people are watching, well, I know there's people watching from Florida and all over. May we ride on the chariot of God and may the zeal of our Lord consume us and may we destroy the enemies of our God, of the church, and that seek to destroy our children. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Amen. Now, a couple quick announcements. Um, very important, so listen close. Some of you just take notes. Next Sunday, weather permitting, we're going to have our service outside in the back. Amen. I'm excited about it. A lot of you I know are excited about it. I'm going to disappoint you in just a minute, but <laughs> just, just follow with me. The service is going to be 11 o'clock. 11. If you get here 10, great. Service is going to start at 11 o'clock. It's going to give uh, uh, some of our guys more time to make sure everything's set up and tested because we're going to put equipment and stuff out there. We're still going to live stream the service. So if you want to stay home, fine, no problem whatsoever. Um, and here's how we're going to do it. If you know that we're going to be seated in the grass area outside right behind the church, it's a big area, it's a park-like area, and we're going to have ushers that are going to help seat you so that we practice social distancing. I want you to come in a mask. I'm going to want you to leave in a mask, just out of respect. During the service, you can take the mask off, no problem. But as soon as the service is over, I want to have a love fest and a hug fest with everybody. You know me. We're not going to have a love fest and a hug fest with everybody. We're going to quietly, you know, well, it doesn't have to be quiet. We're going to go back to our cars, and we're going to go in, and we're going to go home, okay? Now, in the parking spots that go directly and face the grass area, those will be reserved for people who are going to stay in their cars during the service. So roll down your window. We'll have the loudspeakers outside. Those are just for you. Everybody else, we're going to uh, park in the regular spots, and then you're going to walk and sit either by a family or by yourself on the grass. I would encourage you to bring a blanket, bring a lawn chair. That's up to you. The service, we're guessing, are going to be about an hour long or so. Um, it's supposed to be sunny and warm, so bring a hat, bring sunglasses, bring suntan lotion, bring water, bring drinks with you. I don't care. You're allowed to. Uh, you can't bring drinks in the sanctuary, but you can bring them outside with you. No problem whatsoever. Um, follow our usher's instructions. And one more thing, this week, you're going to get sent home a hold harmless form on your computer. And you're going to be able to electronically sign it. Now, why are we doing this? Because this is the world that we live in today. And on it, we're going to make it clear that you know you're aware there is a risk by coming to a service in a, in, in a group of people and that you are, will not hold a church liable if you, um, were for some reason, catch the virus as traced back that you got here during the service. Um, we have to do that. Companies are doing it all over the place. I know you're saying, I'll, I'll never sue. Yeah, but a family member of yours may sue the church. So we have to do this. I hate it. I despise it. Um, also, you'll be attesting on that, that you uh, or anybody, members of your family are not showing any symptoms of the flu. You have no fever. Um, so when you pull in, you're going to be stopped, and you're going to, we're going to check you off the list. If you did not sign one, we will have one on a piece of paper for you to sign and hand it out. So again, please don't be disappointed um, if we can't have a big love fest afterwards. Um, because we do want to be good witnesses to our town. And uh, I would assume some town officials will be here, police will be here. We want them to see that we're uh, trying to be as obedient as we possibly can uh, to some of the laws of the land that are around here, that we're good citizens, good citizens of, of, of this community, and we are good citizens of this community. But we're going to have a great time. We're going to have an awesome time. I can't wait to see us back together. So I'll see you this Wednesday on our next... Uh, um, a videotaping that we have, or live stream that we have, or a Bible study. And I want to encourage you this Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, I'm going to talk about how are some of these things that are going on around us, how they're affecting the end times and the last days. So make sure you get some friends, some family members to watch on Wednesday night, because I'm going to tie a lot of things together. God bless. 
have a great service. I love you. Get your chariot out, polish it up, and start driving it around. Have a great day. Amen. Love you.